aid is not help. In the period 1950 to 1955, total bilateral and multilateral aid from all sources rarely exceeded $1.8 billion per annum. In the 1960s, however, the scale of the operation increased dramatically. Disbursements of official development assistance in 1961, for instance, were 20% higher than they had been the year before. By 1962 total world aid had risen to just a shade under $6 billion, and by 1972 OECD member states alone were giving close to $10 billion a year. By 1984, there had been a threefold increase in this OECD figure OPEC member states had established themselves as major donors, and the Soviet Union was also giving significant quantities of development assistance. Total world aid in 1987 was just over $50 billion, up about 7% on the 1986 figure of $46 billion. One of the remarkable aspects of aid's busy growth is the way in which giving more has, over the passing years, subtly become equated with doing better, indeed with moral virtue. As a result of the activities of pro-aid pressure groups, and of effective public relations by the agencies themselves, increased aid is now a phrase that is used interchangeably with improved aid performance. In almost all diplomatic and economic forums, as the British economist Lord Bauer observes, countries giving a higher percentage of the national income in official aid are described as better performers than others giving a smaller percentage. Indeed so. Official development assistance today is a sacred cow which must never be killed, and which preferably, must be nurtured. Within the United Nations, for example, the whole debate is framed in terms of targets. Since the 1960s the world body has been urging its member states to give 0.7% of their annual GNP as ODA. Those countries that do increase their aid, that do meet the target, are good, in the UN's terms. Conversely, of course, those that decrease their aid are bad. A campaign launched by the British Labour Movement in 1988 promotes this naive and simplistic notion. Under the slogan, Support the Just 0.7 campaign, a leaflet tells us that Britain in 1979, was the most generous of the top seven industrialized nations because it was well on its way to achieving the 0.7% target. Since then, however, as a result of the shameful record of the Conservatives, there has been a disgraceful tum around. Having fallen behind France, Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands and Norway in the generosity stakes, the UK is now on the way to being the meanest nation in the world. Similar judgments on aid performance are also to be found in the influential reports of the Commission on International Development, which met under the chairmanship of Willy Brandt in the 1970s and 1980s. While those donor countries that have surpassed the 0.7% target are fulsomely praised, the failure of many others to reach it is described as deeply disappointing, and as a sign of a marked lack of political will. Noting that aid is in fact falling as a share of the GNP of several wealthy industrialized nations, for which there is no excuse, the Commission urges the recalcitrant donors to set the sights once more on the fulfillment of the 0.7% target. If and when this target is reached, the argument continues, then the people of the third world will inevitably benefit. The notion that increased aid from the North will result in improved conditions in the South, is thus treated as though it were a self-evident truth. It is far from that, however, particularly when what we are talking about is an increase amounting to just a few tenths of a single percentage point of the donor country's GNP. Aid, after all, is just one amongst many different forms of financial flow, and these flows move from south to north as well as from north to south.
to arrive at the real bottom line in the relationship between the rich and the poor nations, it is therefore necessary to total up the figures for global odor with all the other relevant transactions that take place in both directions. When this is done, an interesting and little advertised trend emerges. Since the early 1980s, mainly as a result of a sharp decline in new lending by private banks, coupled with ongoing repayments at rising interest rates of old loans, the wealthy countries have consistently been net recipients of funds from the third world, not net donors to it even when ODA is taken into account. Initially the gain of the North was small, just $300 million in 1983. By 1984, however, it had risen dramatically to $12.5 billion. Since 1985, the poor South's net transfer of finance to the rich nations has exceeded $30 billion per annum. The figure for the year the 1st of July 1987 to the 30th of June 1988, for instance was $39.1 billion. The dictionary tells that aid is a synonym for help. The whole notion that the developing countries are being helped by the developed ones, however, seems to be on the basis of these negative financial transfers alone, to be highly suspect. This general view is best clarified by some specific examples. During the three years 1986 to 1988, the International Monetary Fund received net payments totaling almost $8 billion from the Third World. And recently the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development has also become a significant drain on the resources of poor countries. In the financial year to the 30th of June 1988, it was a net beneficiary of $1.9 billion. Negative transfers of this sort in the multilateral sector are, however, dwarfed by those on a country-by-country -country basis. Between 1982 and 1987 British banks took in more than £80 billion in debt service payments from Latin America. Averaged out, this meant that every man, woman and child in that impoverished continent, had transferred a generous £40 a year, to the City of London. By contrast, Britain's bilateral aid to Latin America during the same period was worth just under 8 pence, per capita, per annum. For the record, India, the UK's largest aid partner, normally receives about 15 pence, per capita per annum, and Campuchere, one of the poorest countries in the world, gets 0.0026 pence per capita per annum. Britain's official development assistance to Gibraltar and the Falkland Islands, on the other hand, averages out respectively at £148 per capita per annum and £5,350 per capita per annum. Such anomalies are found, incidentally, in the odour of every single donor. They illustrate a seminal point. Aid is far too small in macroeconomic terms to do much good to anyone, except to a few favoured mini-states like Gibraltar in the case of the UK or Israel in the case of the US. Neither will marginal increases of the kind envisaged by the Brandt Commission or by Britain's Just 0.7 campaign make any significant difference to this state of affairs. At $60 billion a year, on the other hand, aid is already quite large enough to do harm. It is often profoundly dangerous to the poor, and inimical to their interests. It has financed the creation of monstrous projects that, at vast expense, have devastated the environment, and ruined lives. It has supported and legitimized brutal tyrannies. It has facilitated the emergence of fantastical, and Byzantine bureaucracies, staffed by legions of self-serving hypocrites. It has sapped the initiative, creativity, and enterprise of ordinary people, and substituted the superficial and irrelevant glitz of imported advice. It has sucked potential entrepreneurs and intellectuals in the developing countries into non-productive administrative activities. It has created a moral tone in international affairs that denies the hard task of wealth creation and that substitutes easy handouts for the rigors of self-help.
In addition, throughout the Third World, it has allowed the dead grip of imposed officialdom to suppress popular choice and individual freedom. Aid has its defenders, not least the highly paid public relations men and women, who spend millions of dollars a year justifying the continued existence of the agencies that employ them. Such professional communicators must reject out of hand the obvious conclusions, that aid is a waste of time and money, which its results are fundamentally bad, and that, far from being increased, it should be stopped forthwith before more damage is done. Whenever such suggestions are made, the lobbyists throw up the hands in horror. Despite some regrettable failures, they protest. Aid is justified by its successes, despite some glitches and problems. It is essentially something that works. Most important of all, the emotional touch, the appeal to the heartstrings. They argue with passion that aid must not be stopped, because the poor could not survive without it. The Brandt Commission provided a classic example of this line of thought. For the poorest countries, it told us flatly in its final report, aid is essential to survival. Such statements, however, patronize and undervalue the people of the poor countries concerned. They are, in addition, logically indefensible, when uttered by those who also want us to believe that aid works. Throughout history and pre-history, all countries everywhere got by perfectly well without any aid at all. Furthermore, in the 1950s, they got by with much less aid than they did, for example, in the 1970s, and were apparently none the worse for the experience. Now, suddenly, at the tail end of almost 50 years of development assistance, we are told that large numbers of these same countries have lost the ability to survive a moment longer unless they continue to receive ever larger amounts of aid. If this is indeed the case, and if the only measurable impact of all these decades of development has been to turn tenacious survivors into helpless dependents, then it seems beyond dispute that aid does not work. On the other hand, if the statement that aid works is true, then presumably the poor should be in much better shape than they were before they first began to receive it half a century ago. If so, then aid's job should by now be nearly over, and it ought to be possible to begin a gradual withdrawal without hurting anyone. Of course, the ugly reality is that most poor people, in most poor countries, most of the time, never receive or even make contact with aid in any tangible shape or form. Whether it is present or absent, increased or decreased, are thus issues that are simply irrelevant to the ways in which they conduct their daily lives. After the multi-billion dollar financial flows involved have been shaken through the sieve of overpriced and irrelevant goods that must be bought in the donor countries, filtered again in the deep pockets of hundreds of thousands of foreign experts and aid agency staff, skimmed off by dishonest commission agents, and stolen by corrupt ministers and presidents, there is really very little left to go around. This little, furthermore, is then used thoughtlessly, or maliciously, or irresponsibly by those in power, who have no mandate from the poor, who do not consult with them, and who are utterly indifferent to the fate. Small wonder, then, that the effects of aid are so often vicious and destructive for the most vulnerable members of human society. All this notwithstanding what is to be said about aid's much vaunted successes. Do they justify a stay of execution for the sacred cow? India was frequently cited as a glowing illustration of what development assistance can achieve. Since independence, its overall economic growth rate had been high and, through the Green Revolution, had transformed itself from a net food importer to a major food exporter. India also was, in the 1980s, the world's 10th largest industrial power. It boasted a complete range of heavy industries, and a burgeoning new technology sector, plus its own space program. Donors expressed the confidence in these achievements by continuing to channel very large quantities of odor to the subcontinent, an impressive total of $5.4 billion in 1988.
The underlying reality of India, however, for the vast majority of its population, was just about as grim as it is possible to find anywhere on Earth. The average per capita GNP was still a mere $250 in 1988. It meant that after more than 40 years of independent, development, and the absorption of tens of billions of dollars of foreign aid, more than 300 million Indians, that is, fully a third of the whole population, subsisted below the official poverty line with even the most basic nutritional needs unmet. Two-thirds of the adult population couldn't read and write, and the infant mortality rate was nearly twice as high as that of Vietnam. In the countryside, conditions steadily deteriorated for the majority, who depended on farming. In 1947, half the national income came from agriculture. More than 40 years later, this share was down to a third, but about 70% of the workforce was still employed on the land, the same proportion as a century ago. So much, then, for AIDS' leading success story. There are others, too. In Africa, for example, one frequently hears that Ivory Coast and Malawi, both with high economic growth rates, represent definitive proof that development assistance is capable of achieving much. Yet the Ivory Coast accumulated a national debt of over $8 billion, which had to be paid by a population of just 10 million, hardly an encouraging prospect for the future. In a similar fashion, Malawi's economic miracle also began to look slightly tarnished when account was taken of the hard facts that faced the poor. This country had the fifth highest infant mortality rate in the world, and only 4% of the adult female population could read and write. Africa contains many lessons for the aid lobby. It lost the self-sufficiency in food production that it enjoyed before development assistance was invented and, during the next few decades, became instead, a continent-sized beggar, hopelessly dependent on the largesse of outsiders. Per capita food production fell in every single year, since 1962. Seven out of every ten Africans were, furthermore, reckoned to be destitute, or on the verge of extreme poverty, with the result, that the continent had the highest infant mortality rates in the world, the lowest average life expectancies in the world, the lowest literacy rates, the fewest doctors per head of population, and the fewest children in school. Tellingly, during the period 1980 to 1986, when Africa became, by a considerable margin, the world's most aided continent, GDP per capita fell by an average of 3.4% per annum. Outside Africa the story is much the same. Indeed, in the third world as a whole, while total outstanding debt rose by 10% during 1987-88 to reach $1.21 trillion, that is 39% of GDP, economic growth rates fell from 4.2% to 3.5%. Statistics like these translate, on the ground, into a steady decline in household incomes, and a consequent collapse in the standard of living of the majority of poor people. Thus, in Bangladesh, the infant mortality rate rose from 101 babies per thousand in 1980, to more than 120 per thousand. And, in Bolivia, GDP per capita fell by a third in the same decade. Both Bangladesh and Bolivia were significant recipients of foreign aid. In Nicaragua, by contrast, which had virtually all its aid cut off, since the collapse of the Somoza regime in 1979, things improved noticeably during the I-980s. Without any of the so-called help that outsiders normally offer, the government of national reconstruction succeeded in reducing illiteracy amongst adult Nicaraguans from 53% to just 13%. According to the New England Journal of Medicine, Nicaragua achieved more advances, in most areas of social welfare than in 50 years of dictatorship under the Somoza family. In 1979, with aid, little more than a quarter of the Nicaraguan population had any access to medical services.
By 1982, without aid, three quarters of Nicaraguans had regular access to health care. Overall agricultural production was 8% higher in 1983, without aid, than it had been in 1980, with aid. In addition, since aid was withdrawn, Nicaragua's infant mortality rate dropped from 120 per thousand in 1979, to less than 80 per thousand in 1987. The number of vaccinations against killer diseases given to poor children each year more than doubled during this same aidless period. There was a staggering 98% fall in the number of new malaria cases, and at the level of the national budget total funds allocated by the government to both education and health care have more than tripled. It would seem, then, that official development assistance is neither necessary nor sufficient for development. The poor thrive without it in some countries. In others where it is plentifully available, they suffer the most abject miseries. Such suffering, furthermore, often occurs not in spite of aid, but because of it. To continue with the charade seems to be absurd. Garnered and justified in the name of the destitute and the vulnerable, aid's main function has been to create, and then entrench a powerful new class of rich and privileged people. In the notorious club of parasites and hangers-on made up of the United Nations, the World Bank, and the bilateral agencies, it is aid and nothing else, which has provided hundreds of thousands of jobs for the boys, and that has permitted record-breaking standards to be set in self-serving behavior, arrogance, paternalism, moral cowardice and mendacity. At the same time, in the developing countries, aid has perpetuated the rule of incompetent and venal men, whose leadership would otherwise be utterly non-viable. It has allowed governments, characterized by historic ignorance, avarice and irresponsibility, to thrive. Last but not least, it has condoned, and in some cases, facilitated, the most consistent and grievous abuses of human rights that have occurred anywhere in the world since the Dark Ages. In these times of the 21st century, the time has come for the Lords of Poverty to depart. Their ouster can only be achieved, however, by stopping development assistance in its present form, something that might prove to be in the best interests both of the taxpayers of the rich countries and the poor of the South. Perhaps when the middlemen of the aid industry have been shut out, it will become possible for people to rediscover ways to help one another directly according to the needs and aspirations as they themselves define them, in line with priorities that they themselves have set, and guided by their own agendas.